Okay, a um, couple things. So, did you guys get some good feedback on your, on your games? Listen to the feedback. Incorporate it. It's the most critical component that will lead your design thinking process, okay? Remember, we're not making these things for ourselves. We're making them for someone else. So it's important that we start getting that information back to us, okay? And get as many different eyeballs and as many different experience levels on your, on your prototypes as you can, okay? It's the only way to really kind of start to trim it into something that's going to work or that is working, okay? Um, just having a singular reference point is not enough data to get you going, okay? You need a lot of feedback to really understand if you're hitting the player experience goals that you're after. Uh, hang on to these levels, right? We're going to continue to build them, build on them over the next couple of weeks. So if there's things that are unpolished and unfinished, don't worry, you're going to have an opportunity to continue doing this. As a reminder, this level that you've built is going to be hopefully, you know, hopefully part of our final project, okay? So just don't trash it, keep it around. We are going to start moving on to an interior level, so we can start looking at some different ideas and some considerations that are different from exteriors, but hang on to it. It should, it will come back into the mix here in the not too distant future. Before we go any further, I wanted just to spend a couple moments talking about uh, your application for graduation. Ha ha! For many of you guys, this is the last class in the game design certificate. They're not going to automatically give you this certificate. <laughs> you know, just because you complete the class doesn't mean you're just poof, it's going to show up in your mailbox one day. You have to tell the school that this is the conclusion and that you're ready to get the certificate. You have to apply for it. And there is a hard deadline, okay, of October 5th. It's in the top left hand corner of the SCC homepage. In addition to this being a banner that communicates the date, it's also the link to the, play, to the page in which you have to go do this, okay? So please, please, please go visit this. Apply for the certificate. It's not something that I can just hand you. There's an entire crazy little system here that we need to walk through. Don't be intimidated by it. It's really easy. It's an online form. It's going to ask you for some transcript information. So you need to be able to you know, log into e-services and get all that jazz. It's going to, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. If you want to make it even easier for yourselves, go to admissions and records. The, the men and women of admissions and records, they will help, they will walk you through this process. It's in everyone's best interest to get this filled out. And this is the only way that you're going to get a certificate and a degree. You have to apply for it. So please make sure you go through this, this, uh, this online form. I think specifically, it's down here. Let me screw this down. Here we go. All right, there it is. Petition for a certificate, okay? Many of you guys have been hanging around the GCOM department for a long, long time, so it's very likely that you can also apply for our associate's degree. Fill out the online form. You're not going to earn the degree or certificate until you physically apply for it online, okay? And they have to do this crazy audit of your entire academic record uh, before they give you uh, and, and award you your degree or certificate. They have to go in per student, and this is a very manually, you know, this is a very manual, human-driven kind of event, right? where they have to go by, they have to look at your academic records and they kind of have to check off all the things and make sure that you have, you have everything completed. So get it done, get it done, okay? Um, I'm, gonna remind, I'm gonna remind you guys again uh, on the 5th or as close to it as I can. I'll probably remind you next week and I'll remind you the week after that because it's a really important thing for us uh, going forward. So don't forget, you gotta apply for it. It just takes about 10 minutes of work and then you'll get your degree or certificate. So it's, you, you can't make it any easier, right? It's right there <laughs> on the SEC homepage. It's right, it's big and bold. You can't miss it. Just follow that link, follow the on-screen directions, and you'll be able to just fine. If you want to make it easier, just go over to the admissions and record building. They'll help you. They'll, they'll fill out the form for you, okay? Yeah, you got to take care of it. And, the, and I think this is something that a lot of folks miss, right? Because if you're... For high school, did you have to do this for high school? No, you just showed up at your own graduation and poof, you got a, di a diploma. This is not high school, okay? In order to get a degree or certificate from a college or university, you have to request that certificate from the school, okay? And they're not going to automatically award you that degree or certificate until you've gone through the paperwork, okay? There's always paperwork, okay? Welcome to the first day of the rest of your lives. There's always paperwork, all right? Uh, so do it. It's pretty easy. But you got to do it. 
I can't do it for you. You have to do this for yourself. Okay. And then you look like this lo lovely woman, so happy, just graduating with her cap and gown, right? You, can, you could be that person too. Or this person too, learning how to code with the Everyone Could Code project. All right. Uh, <laughs> So uh, a couple things, and we're going to talk about this towards the end of class. Uh, many of you guys have started to, okay, someone didn't sign out. Or, nope, is, uh, if you go into GCOM 426, I've started to populate the week four content. Uh, this week, as I mentioned a second ago, we're going to start transitioning over to our interior level. And it's important that we continue to practice our technique, right? It all starts, oops, it all starts with a paper design, okay? And that's gonna be our detail or our focus for our lab today, and then we're gonna do some gray boxing for our homework this week, okay? So I'm gonna give you some time in class here in a little bit to start figuring out what this interior level is gonna be. Now, much like our exterior level, there has to be something for our player to do in here. So you're gonna need to prototype and plan and design three playable challenges, three, three different challenges. So it can't be like three jumping challenges, right? You're gonna have three completely different challenges that will give our player a variety of wonderful experiences inside this level, okay? Um, it's a brand new level, yeah. It's a brand new level. We are, in fact, kind of moving on. I hope that you take all the experiences, your, your scars, if you will, your battle wounds from the first level, and use that as an experience to drive your design process for the second level, okay? Um, you know, this is, in, this is where we learn when we kind of start over on a new idea and we iterate and we, uh, you know, we're able to apply. So we'll come back and talk about this again towards the end of class today. Um, but, you know, we're going to be doing a, a paper prototype with a design map, like we, just like we did with the exterior level. And then we're also going to be doing a gray box, just like we did with the exterior level before an interior. Um, okay, a couple things. So I wanted to spend some time today talking about the Moto pipeline, the art pipeline, if you will. Because I think this is becoming a little bit of a sticking point for a lot of folks. Uh, you know, it's been some time, if you will, for, you know, for folks in here uh, since you've had to transition art assets from one app to another. And now that we're working with all the substance tools, all the algorithmic tools, I think it's a really, really good idea to kind of to highlight the round trip, okay, and just get a nice visual refresher on the sequence that we have to go through to create something here in Moto, get it out over into Substance Painter, and then get both the model and the textures back in Unity correctly, okay? Because there, it is a complex sequence. There's a lot of steps in this road, so I want to make sure that we're very explicitly clear. One of the things that you guys were kind of commiserating on, and I share your frustrations, is that when you were gray, bro uh, gray boxing, Pro Builder is not Moto, right? It's just not. Uh, it, it kind of highlights the, the awesomeness of our, of our 3D modeling app, okay? Pro Builder is pretty basic, uh, and that's going to be a, a, you know, a common source of frustration for a lot of people. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good that we have this comparison experience, but I, I want to kind of come back to, to Moto a little bit and define that art pipeline just once again, okay? So I'm working on a level myself for in, over in Unity. Um, I should have brought the, the actual scene file so you guys can see the crazy direction I'm going in. Um, I'll save that maybe for the, for the future. Uh, but this is going to be one of the props that I'm going to be using inside of that level. And as you can imagine, it is a bookcase. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty detailed bookcase. Um, I spent, this is a 100% Moto project, so all of my, all of my uh, edges and what have you are, are ready to rock and roll. Yeah, go ahead. How did I do that? Very carefully. <laughs> um, and, and you know, luckily, luckily for me, um, oh boy, how can I? I am building an homage to one of my favorite environments um, from a film that really launched a lot of people's imagination called The Dark Crystal. Do you guys ever see The Dark Crystal? Yeah, right. If you're, if, you know, it's, it's a pretty big movie, or it was a pretty big movie. And for me, you know, the Dark Crystal and the Labyrinth, I mean, those, those kind of got me going, as did a lot of people. Um, and so I'm building a level, um, actually, full story. <laughs> um, I, a long time ago, probably three or four years ago, 
I said, how cool would it be? There's one of the main characters, her name is Agra, and she has that really cool observatory with all the spinning planets and stuff, and it's a really neat moment in the film. It's probably one of my favorite moments of the film. And I was like, how cool would it be to have a model of that spinning observatory? So that kind of started, the, started my crazy thinking. And I made a model, a pretty, a pretty legit, ex incredibly detailed model of, of that observatory. Um, and then I said, you know, now that once, when I got that done, he goes, you know what would be really cool uh, is to throw this into Unity and actually make a full level of it, actually make the entire environment. It started off with just the spinning planet device. And now it's turned into the entire observatory. Um, so this is one of the props that's going inside of that observatory. So I was lucky, this, the, the answer to your question, is that I have some wonderful reference of the movie itself, of what all these props uh, you know, kind of were looking like. And this is, it's pretty close. Um, I, th I think it's, it's impossible to get exact. The movie was shot in the early 80s. <laughs> the quality of filmmaking and the, uh, the sharpness of the, of the reference imagery is not great. Uh, many of it, many times, what I need to look at look at is out of focus in the background of the environment. So I kind of having to do my best, but it's it's going pretty good so far. This is one of the, this is a bookcase that shows up uh, in the film itself, and uh, this is a pretty close approximation to to how it looks. That's where this design thing came from. Uh, came from, and then I kind of added my own flair to it. You know, I've always said for this project that I'm just trying to get it close. I had to fill in a lot of the gaps myself and use my imagination to take me the rest of the way. Um, so this is the model, but this is just one part of our sequence, right? Of course, we're going to be generating a lot of uh, geometry inside of Moto, but the game art prep pipeline has some steps in it that's different from just staying here inside of Moto, right? Life is happy in the wonderful walled garden of Moto, right? But once we start going out and sending our information to other apps, we have to be very, very mindful of the sequence that we have to follow. Okay, now real quick, and I'll just jot this on the board. Let's kind of define what that sequence is, because there are literally a lot of moving parts to this crazy sequence. So of course we're going to model, right? That's step number one. Okay, we got to make the geometry. What's step number two? UV maps, right? And this is a required element of the game art pipeline. We can kind of get away with it to a certain degree inside of Modo. But in the game art pipeline, you have to create UV maps. This is a mandatory, OK? Uh, your textures are n you're not going to be able to control the textures over in Unity uh, without UV maps, OK? Naturally, we want to have uh, you know, a level of control as to how all this stuff looks. Here's my UV map. Let's just name it. This is bookcase. I like naming my UV maps. I try to make it as clear and as obvious as I can. If you name, if all of your, if all of your models have a UV map named texture, it's going to be really difficult to troubleshoot and edit and manage all of those different UV maps. So be specific. In my opinion, it really does make a big impact on things. I have a singular mesh item inside of my scene. I have a singular I, or UV map inside of my list section of the interface itself. This is another hard requirement. Okay, you can't. You can only have one UV map. Right? So if you're modeling and you have eight UV maps, it's fundamentally not going to work, okay? Unity is not going to understand which of those eight UV maps to put the textures on. You don't get any sort of selection system in Unity. It's kind of elegant in its simplicity, Unity, okay? But we have to be reminded of these limitations. So Uno UV maps, got to have one, okay? One. Let's look at the UVs for my little bookcase here. The geometry is not anything super, super fancy. Um, if you look at it, I'm a big believer that it, you know, of component pieces, whole series of separate pieces that define the mesh, the bases, its own piece. Okay, it makes it a, a whole lot easier to UV map if everything is separated out. It really does. You don't get extra bonus points for making it all one piece. Okay? You're actually making your life a whole lot harder if you try to weld all these things together. Now, for example, these little really intricate uh, front panels. Okay? How did I make this? Yeah, that's curves. Yeah, a whole bunch of curves. But then I made one, right? And then I duplicated it over, trying to model all, what are these? So it's a three by five. Trying to model all 15 of these simultaneously would have just been 
a disaster, right? It would have taken me 10 times longer than it did. I model one, and then I duplicate it 15 times in an array. OK? It goes pretty fast. And oops, you UV map one, and, and whenever you duplicate that geometry, the UVs come along for the ride. All the duplicates will share that exact same UV information. So to you know, make it easier, you don't get bonus points for making it hard. OK? Uh, say again? Yeah, absolutely. Work smarter, not harder. Okay, you know, same goes with a lot of these trim pieces. You know, yeah, I could have gone in and uh, you know welded all of these things together and made them one contiguous polygon and had edge loops and sliced them. I could have done that for sure, right? But did I need to? No. Okay, you're not getting bonus points for making it more difficult on yourself. Okay, you're just making it more difficult on yourself. <laughs> uh, so keep that in mind. I'm a big believer that if you don't see the problem, you don't see the problem, OK? <laughs> you know, it's, these aren't the objects that are going to be manufactured, even though sometimes I kind of design and create minds in that manufacturing mindset. But these aren't going to be ever fabricated out here in the real world. So we don't have to worry about those real world connection issues. All right. Let's go over and look at the UVs real fast. Here they all are, OK? Yeah, there's all my UVs. Pretty, pretty straightforward, nothing too magical here. When you look at uh, their position inside of the UV space, where are they? Yeah, in that, in that top quadrant, right? In the positive UV space, right? This top right-hand quadrant is where all of our UVs need to end up, OK? Um, this is a good practice. And they all share the exact same textile density, right? Luckily for us, the pack command inside of Modo does a great job of making sure that the size, scale, and proportions of all of these polygons and all of their corresponding UVs are proportional to each other, right? Now, in, when it comes to working with UVs, and I think this is the base, or maybe this is the top. Let me select that big piece here. This is the back, excuse me. Okay, so let me grab the top in the bottom here, because these are kind of generally the exact same size, very close in size and shape. Okay? Now, one's rotated 90 degrees from the other, so it's not the easiest thing to see. But generally speaking, these two polygons in my UV map are the exact same size, or very, very similar to each other, right? They need to be proportional. If this UV island down here was three times this big, how would that affect the texture set that's going to go on this thing? Yeah, and the quality within inside of this area of my UV map is going to be so much higher than the other stuff, right? By having all the UVs packed into our positive UV quadrant with the same textile density, we're creating a consistent reproduction of quality across all the polygons in the texture set, OK? Point being, there's not a single portion of my model that's going to look better than the others. It's all going to look the same, OK? And then the resolution of our texture set over in substance is ultimately going to determine our understanding of the quality of the textures themselves, right? Consistent quality throughout all the UVs, OK? It really helps. I can't recommend this pack command enough. Uh, I think it's quite good, OK? Because what it's going to do is that it's going to pack it in there. And it's going to keep the textile density, the proportion, if you will, of all the UV islands the same. OK, yeah? So like basically the UV map thing, you could maybe decide to make a little bit of room for them too through everything and then hit pack, and then it'll And then it'll boop, yeah, right yep. Through. And that's how I UV map things. Okay. I kind of UV map things one at a time, right? And uh, I don't worry about the size of those UVs until I'm done unwrapping everything. And then once I'm done and I'm happy with what I got, hit the pack button. Could you demonstrate an unwrap maybe on like that, uh, the complex shape? Like this in here? Yeah. One of these things? Sure, yeah. absolutely. So, so this is how I would approach it, my thinking behind it. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this on a new map just so I don't screw up what I have already created. OK, so thinking behind this, when I'm unwrapping something, the first thing I think of is, what is the user going to see? What are the high value areas of this part of the mesh that I know my gamer or that I know my render camera is absolutely going to see? And those are the high value areas that I need to focus in on for the UVs. Now, for this part in particular, 
I mean, clearly, you know, pretty much the, all these front face polygons and even into the interior of the beveled edge is something that I know my audience is going to see. Okay, so all of this jazz, even maybe all the way, I would probably go into that polygon right there. Because if you're looking at this item from the front, yeah, you're going to see all the way through to that beveled edge in there. So those are my high value areas. Those get the most attention. And uh, um, those are the ones that I unwrap first. For this model, I'm lucky in the sense that those high, res or those high value objects okay, terminate just perfectly at an edge loop. Okay. I got lucky on that one. So I have two decisions that I have to make here. Um, I can either have my UV seam be where I have selected, or I could go one row down to where it transitions to the back side of the mesh and ask the computer to unwrap all that stuff for me. Okay? And I think that's actually what I did. I made a hard seam at the back facing polygons. Um, all right, so. I'm a big fan of using the unwrap tool. I think it's a pretty great tool. For this piece in, in particular, is actually, let's see, does this have the corners on it? No, okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select that interior piece, okay, the interior loop. And then I've learned with working with the Moto algorithm that it really likes us to select the boundaries of our mesh. It kind of gives it a, an extent, like this, it kind of tells the algorithm, only try to unwrap and flatten out the polygons in with inside this boundary. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I deleted the border edges because you don't see them. Right. right. Yeah, I modeled them in there, but when I placed them in the geometry, it's like they're buried and you're never going to see them. So why have them in there, right? Okay. So with those edges selected, let's just run unwrap and see what we get. And you're going to find that Unwrap does a really great job. Left click and drag. However, wah, wah, that's not exactly what I'm after. That's the best result that Unwrap gave me. Not super hot. Here, I want to see, I'm going to flatten them out real fast. Now, I've selected that top edge there. I know that that is what? Probably one of the top, it's a bottom edge. So that one's going to be flat. These buttons in here, will automatically rotate based off of your selected edge. It's going to look at that selected edge and make it horizontal or vertical. And it's going to move the UV island rigidly against that selection. But look at this. This is, this is no bueno. Yeah, that, that's, that's, not, that's not good. Okay, here's the, the back. The back is good, but the front, boo, ugly. Okay, let's test it. I'm going to enable some viewport textures. Okay. I love these viewport textures. They allow me to test my UVs with an image without having to create a new material and apply that image. It's a great system. Yeah, that's not so hot. Can you guys see, them? See, see how it's all distorted? The image itself, it's bending and warping across the surface of the, of the shape. That's not so hot. Ideally, what we're after here uh, when it comes to our texture reproduction on the mesh is that we want to have the grid be perfectly horizontal and vertical as much as we can. Some concessions will have to be made in specific situations, uh, but if we can get it to be just perfectly, you know, perfectly impressed or pressed correctly across the, the geometry, that's the goal. So I have some work that I need to do on this guy, right? The back is looking, is looking fantastic. I mean, look at that. Yeah. See how all the lines on the image, just perfectly horizontal and vertical. We're not getting any sort of stretching and warping of the, the text characters on the image itself. The back is looking great. The front needs some love. Yeah? So how did you get the, um, the uh, pattern? Yeah, so these are called viewport textures. Okay. It's this little checkered icon at the top of our OpenGL viewport. Okay, And you want to make sure that it's on, so enabled. And then to load in uh, you know, a texture, I'm using the UV texture section. And then you just find one. They should be installed in machine. These are default textures that come uh, as a part of the UV, or excuse me, the Moto installation. And I just double clicked on one. I can double click on another to change it. Yeah, that's super confusing, so I'm not going to use that one. 
Yeah, that's a good one to use because then you can very easily see the warping of the texture. I like my little rainbow grid. It's just me. I like colors. All right, so we have some work that we need to do on this one. Now, I've learned from experience that um, the relax tool does a great job. In my mind, the relax tool is kind of like an iron, and it irons out our UVs, and it tries its best to flatten everything out algorithmically. Okay, it does a good job. Okay, it takes iterations. So if we want to keep applying this algorithm to our mesh, like in all honesty, I usually put this at like 2,000. Okay, and then it's going to think and chug for a second. Yeah, so this is the best result. Even at 2,000 iterations of the algorithm, this is the best that it could give me, which is kind of worse than unrelaxed, right? Uh, so we have some problems. And this is a, a lesson learned from, from experience working inside of, of, uh, of the unwrap tool. You kind of start to learn uh, the quirks of the algorithms as you start to get a little bit more comfortable or more experienced with them. And one of the things that I picked up is that when we go from a flat surface like all of these, because all of these polygons, perfectly flat, right? But then we start to transition into a whole series of non-planar polygons, right? They're all curved, if you will. Uh, at that transition point, the computer starts to warp and distort the final result pretty intensely as it's done here. So here's my solution, and it's pretty easy. I want to start, let's do this. I want to grab this. That's a loop that I made. And I'm just going to grab all of these polygons. And I'm just going to unwrap these. These first, because these are all the flat faces. Okay, I'll run unwrap. Boom! Look at it now. That's fantastic. That's actually what I'm after. Let me orient it a little bit more directly. Yes, that's wonderful. Now that looks almost exactly like my mesh. Aha! Huzzah! Check it out. Well, I'm just I'm just using a different sequence now. Okay, I'm not trying to unwrap everything. I'm trying to unwrap the planar surfaces first, right? which is giving me some really great results. Oh, yeah. So I just unwrapped those. I didn't try to unwrap the planar surfaces and all of these guys in here, the non-planar surfaces. So what about all of these guys? Well, this is where the art of UV mapping comes in a little bit. I'm going to uh, unwrap each one of these individually, just to ensure I get a really good, consistent result. Okay? And I want each, one, each of these polygons to be separate. So I'm going to convert it to edges and then unwrap it. And that's what we get. Each polygon has now been unwrapped individually, right? And so we're getting a true kind of planar representation of all of those, of all of those polygons in UV space. Now, don't worry. We'll come back to those in a minute. Yeah. So select the loop, hide everything else, convert the polygonal selection into edges, and then we'll unwrap every single polygon individually. All right, so what are we going to do with all of these really crazy shapes? Well, luckily for us, Moto has a whole series of really great move and sew tools that will allow us to connect all of these individual polygons back into our, uh, our master shape, this one, pretty quickly. So notice that when I select the interior edge loop of my big shape, all of these become highlighted as well. Because what we're selecting here is actually the exact same edge, but on two different polygons, right? All these polygons on the interior, the shape, are connected. So the selected edge is the bottom edge for this polygon, but it's the top edge for this other polygon. It's the exact same edge. It's the shared edge. I want to use this share edge to start sewing all this stuff together. And it happens pretty magically. That's where all of these tools at the bottom of our toolbar come in. So uh, let's see. So, okay. Oops, excuse me. Uh, moving so, not moving so. Let's see, what is going on? I want selected and unselected. Oh, it's being cut off by the bottom. No, it's not. My brain is going at the end of the day. Um, oops. Yeah, or let's do this. 
Oh, come on now. This is, I apologize. I'm traveling bef between three different versions of Moto right now. <laughs> 11, 12, and 12.2 is in beta, and I've been working in the beta for 12.2 for the past like two months. And they've completely changed all their, their the layout for all their UV mapping tools. Would you recommend uh, upgrading because it's giving you the option to have a kind of like... 12.2? Yeah. 12.2 is in beta still. In, in, I think I have 11 to 12. Oh, yeah. Upgrade 11 to 12. Yeah, for sure. So um, hold on one second here. Yeah, that's right. In this version of Moto, it's the modifier keys that change. So I want the sew command. So if you hold down shift, it will, it will sew the selected option is unselected. So I want to do selected. Oops, I want unselected. Actually, I want the sew options, which is the control key. And I want to do move, um, let's do center of selected. Come on now, let's do one. Nope. Yeah, I want, or maybe I want move and sew. I was pick, clicking on the wrong one, I'm sorry. I want move <laughs> and sew. Golly, it's Friday, my brain is starting to melt. Because I want to move this guy and I want to sew it over here. So uh, I want move and sew, uns or selected, which is shift. There we go, and now it's working. You can do it as a group. Sometimes it wigs out. Yeah, let me go back in time. Let's see if that changes it. Yeah, it works on some. I've actually seen this happen. So we got about a half a dozen of them here that didn't sew. That's not the end of the world, because I could always tear them off, unwrap them, get them back to the original shape. So I got, what, six, seven of these that I need to fix? And then I'll just do these seven individually. So it looks that one, sew it in, that one. That one. There, and I think I've got them all in there. Yeah. Um, we need to clean this up a little bit and connect these back into, uh, you know, I want these to be joined together. And yep, just the sew command will average them out. But I need to select all of them quickly, and I'm not going to sit here and select both of them with my mouse, because that's a pain in the rear. Uh, so the OpenGL viewport is going to allow me to select these pretty quickly with the up arrow. I'll select two, and then it will repeat the selection pattern. And then I'll just sew them together, all the reds away. Let's do the exact same thing. Okay, some broke, but that's okay, because it's not too many. Believe it or not. I, soon? Actually, is it in beta, or is it still in alpha? I really don't know, but it's a... It's, uh, yeah, they're not changing the functionality, but they've changed the layout, and they've given each button an icon now, which is cool. Um, very different. It's taken me a little bit getting used to, and now, um, now I'm having a hard time going back, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so that one's really kind of wigging out still. Nope, there it goes. So it's not, making it, it's not about making it all work at the exact same time. I think that's very rarely going to happen with just UV tools, since each one of these shapes is so unique and so different from the rest. There we go. And then I'll use the OpenGL selection to make fast work. Selecting individual edges and verts and what have you in, in the uh, UV world is, is not fun. There it is. Now I could go in and select and change some of these little errors. See how on this polygon it starts to taper as it gets closer down in here? You know, I could go in and fix that for sure. Right? I can move the vert around at the end and, uh, and resolve some of this. Okay, I could even use maybe like an element action center to move it along specifically that, you know, that angle. I could do that. You know, no one's ever going to see and that distortion of the vert being a millimeter off. So I'm not going to focus too much of my energy making it absolutely perfect. Like here's a great example. See how it all kind of pinches and tapers as it goes down to the point of this. Yeah, I could just fix it if I wanted to, but 
I'm not going to spend too much energy on it. So that's how I'd unwrap this one. You can try it, see if, see if it works. Um, I've learned with my experience unwrapping things, you just got to experiment until you get a good result. Um, experience will start to be your, your master and the leader of your decision making process. I've gotten pretty fast and pretty comfortable with the UV tools and motos, and I can almost kind of predict what the algorithm is going to do. Um, but you know, it's you got to experiment to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these. Yeah. I don't know what they do either because they're just they're algorithms. They're different. They're not random. Yeah, there is, it's a different mathematical approach to trying to flatten these polygons. And they're referencing the mesh differently. Um, personally, I kind of hang out in the conformal and adaptive. Those seem to give me the most consistent results. Spring never works. And angle base doesn't, you know, there are very niche specific use case scenarios for those algorithms. I don't know what those are, right? Um, they. I, yeah, I hang out in conformal and spring for the, or adaptive for the majority of them. Same with the, uh, the unwrap, the unwrap tool. You have those very similar methods as well, angled base and conformal. I usually experiment with these and sometimes I get one that gives me a good unwrap, at times the other gives me the better unwrap. So you just got to experiment. Look at what it's doing, try some alternatives. All right. All right. Let me get rid of this UV map. Here's this one. Things are looking good. I always do a really good check. I really like these viewport textures. Now what I'm looking for here is just a consistent reproduction of the texture across the surface of my geometry. So point being, I'm trying to get all the, all the grid squares on the image about the same size. The pack command does a, does a bang out job of doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the yep. And then just kind of reduplicate everything. Yeah. So yep. there's no way to like apply the same UV unwrapping because they're obviously the same geometry. Yeah. I made one and I unwrapped it and, and then I then I duplicated it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have, you know, good good three D modelers turn into like good chess players. Mm -hmm. You think eight or nine steps ahead. Um, and I knew that I was going to have this one shape repeated a number of different times in this one model. So when I made one and I was happy with that one, I unwrapped it real fast. Did you kind of like undo the, the single duplicated model one? I didn't actually. I put some placeholder geometry in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, in all honesty, for the, I, they're in the earlier versions of this project file, I had <laughs> the basic proportions of my bookcase established with just a couple cubes. And that gave me a good measuring stick. And I sliced up that cube to get like an understanding of how many individual grid squares I'm going to need across the face of the bookcase. Uh, so when it came time to make my one kind of panel here, I knew that it was already going to work with inside the, the general proportion of the sculpture that I, that I blocked out. Um, but you certainly could duplicate them all and then you know, delete the ones that you don't really need, aren't going to need, unwrap it, and then reduplicate it. That works too, just different approach. Uh, no. Well, no, I take that back. Um, if something's going to be like algorithmically, like procedurally shattered or destroyed, or if there's a deformation concern that needs, comes to the surface, there could be some, some purposes for, for gluing everything together and welding all the verts. Um, but, but generally speaking, I keep things separated. It gives you the most flexibility. It really does. It makes it a lot easier. It makes it a lot easier. Yeah, you don't get like respect points as 3D modelers for having it all be like welded together. Because most 3D modelers will go, dude, you just wasted your time, right? <laughs> you didn't have to do that. And, and in the production world, you know, I went from, this took me about an hour to flush out, right? Um, that's about how, for a prop, that's about how much time you're going to get to make the model, right? From start to finish. So you got to move fast. Having everything welded together is going to slow you down. Big time. All right. So I'm real happy with the way this looks. The model's looking pretty awesome. Uh, my UV maps are looking pretty awesome. But what's the next sequence in our, in our production pipeline here? 
before we paint it. We just tested it. It looks good. Yeah. Before we export it, there's one more. Before we even texture it, there's one more really important step. I like that. Good. You guys got bonus points for saying doing save as. That's not it, but good job. <laughs> Normal maps, and specifically all your vertex information, your vertex, uh, your vertex weights. Your, uh, another way to think of it is all the hard and soft edges that you have to define. Yeah. Uh, vertex normals, excuse me. Vertex normals. Okay. This is a very, very critical stage for the game art pipeline. This is absolutely unique. Okay. Uh, if you're keeping it all inside of Modo, you don't have to do this step. Because Moto understands the direction all the normals are facing internally. But now that we're sending this model externally, and we're going to be using a different application called Unity to render all these geometry, we need to start defining the direction all these verts are facing inside the scene itself. Unity, or excuse me, Moto actually gives us a really solid set of tools. I like, they're getting better with their implementation of their vertex normal tools. It's good. Um, of course, naturally, the game layout We'll draw focus to all that stuff. Okay, they're over here. Vertex map information, all your vertex normals. However, you know, I think you know, would encourage you to start using all of these buttons in here. Have you guys noticed this part of the new UI in, in this version of the 12 series? Yeah, this is bringing to the surface a lot of the toolbars that we see in other layouts. The way the Foundry is going with their kind of UI aesthetic is they're trying to create, they're trying to simplify the number of layouts that we have. Is at the moment, if you look at all the layouts, I mean, look at all these tabs up here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's twelve different layouts, <laughs> and so they're trying to reduce and simplify. This toolbar in the upper left-hand corner is their first implementation of this simplification strategy. So these are all of our game tools right here. So it brings open that exact same toolbar that we saw over inside of our game layout. So here's all of our, our vertex map uh, normal information. So what we need to do in here, and I'm going to go and open up my other maps. I already have it done. Now let me do this. I want to do a save as, just so I can do it with you guys. And I want to delete all this stuff. Okay. Yeah, you can't vaguely remember it. You gotta, you gotta do it now. All right. So when you are done with your UVs, you go over here and your list tabs. This other map section should be, should be empty. Okay. There may be something in this as UV constraints. That's gonna be the viewport, uh, the viewport texture that I was using to check my UVs. You can delete that. It's not necessary. Okay. But we need to start filling in some very important vertex map information that's specific to the game art pipeline. And we need to tell the computer how to shade across all these different, all these different normals. Okay? And we do that by going into defining hard edges and soft edges. The hard edges stop the shading, the soft edges continue the shading across all these surfaces. Okay? They've changed the layout a little bit. If you're coming from the 11 series, this looks very, very different. Okay? We start here, hardened edges. I always start with the hard edges first. Okay? There's a number of different options here that you can load in to either have it automatically by an angle determine what's hard and what's soft, or you can manually go in and do it. The by angle section is a fast way of getting something on, the, on, on, on paper, right? So I choose by angle. It's going to look at this angle. Uh, which is a good place to begin. So if it's under 40 degrees, it's going to make it a hard edge. If it's over 40 degrees, it's going to leave it as a soft edge. So if you have like a cylinder, okay, it's going to keep all the radial edge loops going around the cylinder soft, which is what we want, because we want the computer to smooth across all those faces. So I'm going to harden uh, by 40 degrees. You don't do anything until you hit the big harden button. Okay. And then we can select and preview all of our hard edges right there. So that's what it just did. Notice that it made it a hard edge vertex map over here in my others list. And now I do a good, yeah, see it messed up. I do a good discount double check. Look, it didn't, didn't continue it. Now if you look very carefully, this is a perfect visualization as to what the computer is doing. 
Notice on the polygons above, you can actually see the, uh, the computer shade this polygon and this polygon almost individually. It's not smooth, it's not, it's not rounding across those surface normals. If you compare it to what's happening here, see how we don't get that angular edge? That's not a lighting thing, it's a smoothing group thing, okay? So if I select it and then return to my, my tools, let's do edges. If I do harden, pff, there it goes. Now it's, yeah, now it's giving me that angular look that I'm after. So you have to do a, a little double check. Go around your mesh, here's another one. Harden it, yeah. You can actually see it start to update inside of OpenGL, which is nice. This is a pretty good job. Let's harden it. Oops, I didn't click on the wrong button. There we go. Now it's shading it correctly, and it's smoothing towards the direction I want to go. Now let's try something else here. Maybe I don't want it to, or maybe I don't want uh, it to stop its smoothing right here in the middle. Maybe I want the computer to smooth all the polygons from that edge loop to that edge loop. Interesting idea, right? Make it look a little bit more curvy. Okay, check it out. I'm going to grab that edge loop and now I'm going to soften them. And soften it. Yeah. Some of these guys in here are getting in the way. This may be a bad, a bad example or a bad place for it. But point being, you need to go in and look at how all these things are working in an experiment. The first thing that I do at the next step, which is to get this out and over into substance, is that I just look at all of my smoothing groups. Okay? And I just really under before I start texturing everything, I make sure that the mesh and all the vertex directions are going the way I want. So it won't show you where the hard edges are going. Yeah, and that I guess is a little bit not surprising for me. Because uh, if you look at the, the shading properties, the smoothing angle down here. Yeah. Interesting. That could be a graphics card thing. It honestly could. So with my crease by smoothing angle on, or off, excuse me. Let's see, is it changing it? A little bit, yeah. Interesting. Here's my, kind of why I'm not focusing too much on this, because ultimately it's up to substance to tell us how this works. We're not gonna have access to this material here in Moto, right? Because over in substance, we're using the substance material, which is identical to the Unity material, okay? Um, so I, I try to look at mine over in substance because that's going to be the big, the big indicator if a change needs to be made. And it could be a graphics card thing. It honestly could be a graphics card thing. Um, all right, let's keep cruising here. Interesting. Okay. All right. Let's keep cruising here because uh, there's one more step. Let's go back into my lists. So I gotta go through and define all these hard and soft edges. And you're gonna get this hard edge map in, uh, in your list section, but there's one more thing that we need to create, okay? And that's our tangent basis. Does anyone remember which tangent basis down here we need to, to load in? Yeah, MIK, M-I-K-K, MIK, the MIK tangent basis. This is the tangent basis. So this is like a mathematical understand, uh, uh, understanding of the direction all of our vertex normals are facing. Okay? Um, this is what lines up and syncs with both substance and unity. Okay? So you want to make sure that we have the MIC tangent basis applied. And there it goes. It shows up as another map in our other map section in our list palette. Okay? I wish it would tell you which tangent basis it was. It'd be great if it said like MIC tangent basis. That'd be helpful, right? But there it is. If you're not sure of which one you have, just delete it. Just delete it, then go back over, boop, create MIC tangent basis, 
we're on our way. Okay. So you got to have those two things completed in Moto before we export it out over into Unity. But there's one more thing here in Moto that we have to do, and this is something that's going to be uh, computer specific. Okay, I'm going to put this on the board because it's something that we honestly need to look at. And that's our FBX IO properties. Okay, because of course we're going to be using the FBX file format to send uh, geometry and material information. Um, oh, excuse me, actually, I missed a step. My fault. I'm getting ahead of myself. So the FBX IO, that's actually step five. <laughs> step three is a material. We have to assign all these polygons to a material, a moto material. Now, this is going to make the trip over into Substance and over into Unity. So how we set it up is important. And then the FBX IO. So moto material first. And then I'll take you over to the FBX IO properties. So this is really, really easy. I have an unused material that's that was in my shader tree. Uh, actually, let me just show you what, why it's in here. The base sculpt. This is a good practice to get into. And this is something that I find uh, I doing all the time. The base sculpt male. Okay, this is a mesh preset. It's this mesh preset. Whenever I'm blocking out a model, I put this in here. Okay, I put it in just to get a good understanding of height and scale. This is a big bookcase. I'm lucky in the film that you can actually see one of the characters standing in front of it, and it's huge. It's a really tall bookcase in the scene. So I always put this in here to help me understand how big or how small these things are, right? I'm currently working on a whole series of props for my level that are a whole series of tables and chairs. And better believe it, in every project file, there's, there's that dude standing in there so I can see, figure out, okay, how high do I want the table to be? Or where's the chair? You know, where's the chair seat need to be? It's a good visual kind of representation of scale. So, and luckily for us, it's really simple to delete. Boop, bye bye. Under the shader tree, I have two material groups now that aren't really being used by any sort of geometry inside of the scene. We have a great command in Moto under the texture pull down menu that says purged unused materials, right? Check this out. Since those two material groups are not currently assigned to any polygons, bye bye. It deletes them for us automatically, which is nice. Okay. Um, now I can quickly go back, grab all those polygons, call this bookcase. There we go. And now I have every single polygon for this piece of geometry assigned to a singular material, which will then start to flow through my kind of, uh, you know, through my production pipeline. Okay. All right. So we've made a singular material that all those polygons are assigned to. Now we look at the FBX IO properties. And you can find these preferences inside of your global mode of preferences. It's, it's really easy. There's one thing that we need to double check. Okay, and It's way down here under the file IO category. Uh, there it is, FBX IO. There's one option in here that we need to ensure that's on. Okay, actually there's two. For me personally, I always turn off the cameras and the lights because I don't want to export all my cameras and light information from Moto. I just want the geometry, the materials, the animation. We'll talk about that in the upcoming weeks. But this is the most important part, okay? Save smoothing groups, okay? All those hard edges and soft edges that we just defined are going to be saved in what's called a smoothing group. If that's not on, all that hard and soft, inf soft edge information is not going to leave Moto. Andy. Um, your last smoothing uh, when you got started on FBX. I'm sorry. So I'm in the Moto properties, preferences, excuse me. Preferences. The global Moto preferences, right? Which you can find under the black Moto pull down menu here. And if we look at the file I.O. for the FBX file format, there it is, the input output properties. I just want to make sure that save smoothing groups is on. Save tangent bases also needs to be on, but that more, I've noticed that with the current version of, uh, of Moto that seems to be enabled by default. The smoothing groups often is not on, so you want to do, you know, do a good double check. 
This is something that I see. And it's one of those things that you turn on once and then you forget about it. But over in the lab and over in here where the machines reset every night at midnight, this property is something that you're going to have to you know, enable every single time. Maybe. Point being, check it out. Don't assume that it's on. I think it's probably safe just to assume that it's off. Okay. All right. Great. Now, with that done, I can export this thing. How are we going to export our files from Moto so we can get it over into Substance and start working over there? You got it. So do it in the item list. Okay. I just have one item that I want to select. If you had multiple items that you want to select into one project file, just have them all selected. Right click. Say again? I think I did already. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. So we'll right click, export selected layers. Look at your standard Moto scene. I want FBX 2018, please. I just do, I always do just layers. This is just for me, just to make sure that this one layer is select or exported. That's just me. And you'll get a, your standard kind of OS finder. And uh, I like to keep a pretty consistent naming convention. And I always put in here for mine, for the FBX, you could just leave it as an FBX, that's fine. Okay? Um, that will actually work as long as you understand the role of this FBX. Uh, you know, sometimes I put SP there for Substance Painter, just so I know that this is the file that went to Substance Painter. Okay? Uh, I see a lot of folks just leaving it like that, which is cool too. Have a, have a system and then follow that system. All right. You're almost always going to get a warning. There's nothing you can do about it, so just hit OK. <laughs> I don't understand why we need to have a warning when they don't give us an option to change anything. All right, let's go over to Substance Painter real fast and pop this sucker in and see how we're doing. Okay. New version of Substance Painter, by the way, came out just before the school semester began. It's pretty cool. A lot of good stuff on there. They're doing some, uh, some really neat things with their shaders. There's even a newer version, 2018 2.2. .2 which looks like a whole bunch of, whole bunch of uh, no, I don't want to update. All right. So here in Substance, what's my pipeline? What do we need to do first? Yeah, how do we do that, Boogie? So we're going to do File New. OK. Here we go. And let's, uh, there's some things in here that we want to use, a template. OK. In previous iterations of this class, we were just using the standard uh, PBR, you know, out this one right here, metallic roughness. This worked really well just kind of in general use, okay? But keep in mind, for this class, what we're doing is that we're sending stuff over into Unity. So we need to change the default material, or excuse me, the default shader that Substance is using so that all of our information is going where we're going to need to go. So Unity 5, okay? Now, if you don't set this now, it's okay. You can change it later, too. It's really easy to change it. So if you forget, it's not the end of the world. So let's go select our file. There it is. Uh, I'll leave the document resolution. Why not? Let's do 2K. The normal map format will be OpenGL. I don't, need any, I don't have any sort of uh, mesh maps that I need to import, although we will talk about this going forward, uh, maybe towards the end of the semester, the three-quarter point. I'll talk about the rounded edge shader in Moto and how we can bake out that normal map information and incorporate it into our shading pipeline here. It's good stuff, actually. Is it okay? Ah, there it is. Ah, it worked. Okay, it worked. So what I'm doing here is that I'm just going to go in and just do an honest evaluation of all of my hard edges. Just a real quick, a real quick heads up. I already know from a previous evaluation that I'm pretty, pretty stellar. I like what I have here. This is looking good. Okay, so there's the model. If you look over here in your texture set list, uh, why is it called bookcase? Is that the, material you made in Moto? the material I made in Moto was named bookcase. Okay, if it's just if you're using the default material, what's going to show up there? default. So be specific. It helps. It really does help. 
protect your 3 a.m. brain, as they say, okay? Because at 3 a.m., uh, you know, you don't think right. <laughs> um, okay. I mentioned earlier that if you need to change the settings, you can real easily. And uh, I want to use, let's see, uh, which one am I on? Oops. All zoomed in, it doesn't work. Go away. Back. So this is where you can change your shader settings. So if you didn't set it right the first time, and you just want the PBR Metal Rough, the Unity 5.1 is where you want to go. Uh, there's a whole series of other shaders that you can use. Some of these are legacy ones. Uh, the PBR Metal Rough, this is the new one. So just make sure you, that's, that's loaded in here. That's all you really need to do for your shader settings. Let's bake some mesh maps real fast. Because mesh maps are the bee's knees, as they say. And they're definitely going to help us in our, in our texture set creation. I haven't actually textured this thing yet. So this is kind of, now I'm like, you know, now I'm excited because now I'm doing something I haven't gotten to yet. Generally, when I make all the models, I make all the models and make all the UVs, and then I go on to the next model. And then I do kind of all my texturing at once, right? Uh, I've learned just for me personally that there's some exhaustion that sets in. And uh, I need to move on to a new project and look at something new after a couple hours of staring at a bookcase. It's like, OK, I don't want to do the textures now. Uh, I need to go on to something else that's new and exciting just to keep it fresh. All right. So let's bake some mesh maps here. And I'll leave all these. I think I'm just going to leave them at the defaults. The only thing that I like to change is the number of secondary rays that I, that I, that I pop out for my ambient occlusion. Since I'm baking something, I only like to bake my mesh maps once, so I'll put that to 256. Uh, in addition, I want to make sure that the resolution, this is something that they've been working on. In previous versions of Substance, this was different than the texture resolution, the texture set resolution. So the output size is 2K, which I like. Let's bake these things real fast. It doesn't take too long. And then we'll start throwing some. I'll just use some presets today just to kind of walk through this pretty quickly. It's taking a long time to bake the ambient occlusion because I put my rays to 256. I need a baking song, right? A Jeopardy song, maybe. Here we go. It goes pretty quick. The crew at Algorithmic is doing an excellent, excellent job with their uh, software development. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the direction that, that we're going. And if you look at my bake over here, yeah, things are starting to look pretty cool. Now you can definitely see the impact of all of that ambient occlusion. I always like to go, do a good, good double check on everything, make sure I'm not getting any sort of weird artifacting. Nothing that's show stopping. Sometimes some small little errors will get get a clue. Like I'm getting a little bit of an ambient occlusion error right along. I can see it showing up. Oops. I can see it showing up right underneath my cursor right there. But you know what? I'm going to keep going. That's not a show stopper. A baking error. You start to investigate. You start to see what maybe is causing the baking area. Uh, is it a bake setting that you need to change? Sometimes increasing the quality of the bake settings will change it. At times, going in and adjusting the distances that all of your cage rays are going, like specifically this max frontal and this max rear, uh, rear distances is something that can change the output of all your bakes. Uh, Sometimes it's the geometry that's just broken. Sometimes it's the normals of the geometry that's just broken. So you just kind of have to go in and start investigating it. Um, I don't really advance on to the next stage of development until, until I'm a happy camper. All right. I'm going to hit F2 just so I can see my 3D viewport. And I don't know. You know, I really have no idea where I'm going with this. Like I said, I haven't actually textured this thing yet. So let's have some fun. Uh, the first thing that I like to do when I work in Substance Painter is make a whole bunch of groups and I start masking things out. That way I can experiment pretty quickly with how things are going to look and go through my look development process. Um, so I think I want to have, I'm remembering back to the reference, I'm pretty sure the top and the frame is one color and then the box of the bookcase is another. Yeah, so let's do that. 
let's go in that direction. Let's make a folder, and I'll start masking that folder out. And then I'm going to use my Polygon Fill tool to allow me to go in and start making some changes uh, on the UV map. So this is the UV map op option. We can fill by what verts, surfaces, objects, and then UV map islands. Okay. Another good reason why to have everything separated out and not be welded together geometrically is that it makes this stage uh, go a whole lot faster. So I'm painting with white. So whatever is white will be seen by this folder. Let's just call this dark brown wood just to make sure that we're doing it correctly. Here's what I'll do. Inside this folder, let's just put a fill layer. Okay, That fill layer is just a placeholder. And I'll make the uniform color, the base color of my fill layer, I don't know, just bright red. So anything that's red is adopting the mask correctly. Anything that's kind of white is not going to be the contents of that folder. Let's do it real quick. So I got my polygonal fill tool on. That guy, I'm painting by UV Islands. And let's see. There we go. That's a UV Island that I want. And that feller too. Yeah, that's good. So that's all going to be one color. Same with the back. Yep. Awesome. And then here's a great suggestion. Put everything in a folder. Have everything be masked and controlled by a very specific folder. Okay. Uh, don't leave anything unmasked. So as, as silly as it sounds, light wood. I want to make a new folder and put all of the unmasked stuff in there. So uh, let's see, same idea. This time I'll make it blue or that color, why not? So anytime I see this lovely teal, I know that this folder's mask is working the way I want it to work. You can do multiples at the same time. It gets dangerous because this is what this drives me crazy. It actually selects through the mesh. So I, you kind of have to just end up clicking on it. Yep, just takes a couple seconds to do it. But you only have to do it once. Now I made a boo boo. intentionally here. There we go. There we go. I made a boo-boo and I did this intentionally. Okay. I want these little these little turrets here in the center to be like a, me a metallic color, I think. Okay. Um, but I masked it out into this other folder. And that's okay because we can always go back and just paint with black. Okay. Black is off. So I don't want these turret things to be influenced by that folder. They all share the same UV space, and, and I did that intentionally just to keep the quality up. Yeah, so let's make sure that those go into their folder, little turret things. Let's call this the folder metal, give it a black mask, and then I won't, I won't add a fill layer in there because luckily it's just a, oops. Did I get it? I'm not sure if I got it. Yep, I got it. You hold on the option key and click on the mask, you can see exactly what's masked out. Let's go back and see the material now. All right. So clearly, oh, I forgot the shelves. I can't forget the shelves. The shelves probably need to be the same light wood. There we go. All right. Rock and roll. I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, so now let's, we're just going to use some of the presets that are found uh, here inside of, inside of Substance. I'm not going to make this too, too, too fancy. So smart materials. I'm a big fan of smart materials because it uses all those mesh maps that we created a second ago. And let's just do, for dark wood, we'll do wood walnut. Get rid of my fill layer. 
And I got some issues here. I got some problems. And we'll talk about the solutions to those problems here in a second. And then for the light wood, I don't know. Let's just do a wax candle. No, let's do beach. Why not? All right. And then for the metal, what are we going to do for the metal? Let's do um, steel stained. That looks horrible. Let's do bronze armor. Okay, that's good enough. No, I don't want to do bronze armor. There we go. That works. Should I even may want to make these little trim pieces in the front metal too, but we'll get there. Yeah. All right, so if you look at what's going on here, I have a little bit of a problem that I need to resolve, okay? And I want you to very carefully look at the orientation of the wood grain and tell me what my problem is. And maybe I'll turn off this other light so you guys can see it. I recognize that it's pretty dark. So what's my problem? Well, everything is textured, so yay. Good job, Pat. Awesome. Oops, excuse me. The wood grain is going the wrong way. Yeah, look at the top here. So the wood grain is going this way. Okay? And if you look at the back, it's going up and down like it should be, right? So the orientation of the wood grain on the top piece here is wrong. Is wrong. So I need to fix it. Um, luckily for us, and I have that issue all across the board. Yeah. If you look carefully at these little trim pieces, the wood grain should be going horizontally across the mesh, not vertically across the mesh. That breaks the illusion pretty instantaneously, right? So we need to go in and fix some of this. And just for brevity's sake, I'm just going to go in and fix the the walnut here at the top because it's going to be pretty pretty easy. And uh, here's a great little trick. I'm going to make two of these. This is the fast, easy way of fixing the problem. Uh, I'll have one material group that is the uh, vertical. And then I'm just going to duplicate that entire thing, that entire folder hierarchy, which got a lot of stuff. And then this one's going to be horizontal. Okay. Now, let's, uh, before we go any further, let's fix our masks. Okay, so for the vertical one, see that's good, that's good. I'm going to unmask that one. So now I'm looking very carefully. Huh? I'm painting with black. Yeah, white's on, black's off. Okay, so that part in there, and shoot, look at these. Yeah. Is it back working? Let's find out.
Oh, we're back. Maybe. Yay. For our live stream. Maybe. That's weird. So, sorry for the awkward pause in the live stream if you're watching this later on in the week. I, it wasn't me. It just YouTube broke. It's not my fault. It's YouTube's fault. Actually, in all honesty, it's probably our network's fault. I'm performing the cardinal sin of all streamers, and I'm doing this over Wi-Fi, which is not what you should ever, ever <laughs> be doing when it comes to streaming this. But that's, uh, we only have one network drop at this computer station, so that's kind of what I'm limited to. What can you do? All right, while we wait for a couple folks to get back from break, I'm going to go ahead and just fix my textures because I want to. Yeah, if you're, you know, not that you have to follow along, and I'll just talk so you guys can kind of get a good sense of this. I figured out what my problem was. If you look carefully with both of these two material groups turned on, the illusion of the, the wood grain going horizontally across this front board is not right. It's, not, it's completely broken. And there's a reason for that. And the reason, and I, I discovered it once I turned off this front material group, is that I didn't unmask this section. So all the normal map section from the layer below it is still, feed, is still being fed upward, vertically, to the top of my layer stacked here in substance. And however, it's a real easy fix. Just need to untag these. Yeah, now it's working the way I want it to work. Let's see if there are any other bugs that I need to smash. So far, so good. There's some bugs down here that I think I needed to smash. So, All right, that's good enough for government work, as they say. There we go. It's not at all what it looks like in the film, but good enough for good enough for today. Yeah, it's 
parts broken on the back. And that's going to drive me crazy. Saving. All right, that's good enough for me. All right, we all back from our break. Many apologies for the crash of the live stream. I fixed it. So there'll be an awkward pause for probably, I don't know, 10 minutes or so if you're going back and and looking at this again, which I hope that you do. I really wanted to make sure the live stream was going because uh, this next part is, I think, a section that a lot of folks get a little shaky on. Um, in previous semesters, we spent a lot of time working um, in, uh, inside, inside of Substance Painter, uh, but getting things out and over into Unity is not hard. It's really actually pretty easy, but there are some steps in here that we need to make sure that we're, that we're following to, to, get a, to get a consistent result, okay? Now, first and foremost, do a good double check on everything, okay? While you guys were on break, I was just going through and fixing it, and I'm pretty happy with the way this looks. I think it looks pretty sweet, good enough for, good enough for me to send it over into Unity. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and all the material presets will. You just got to find the right component of that preset uh, to make it spin. Now, for this one specifically, um, there was a couple. So here's the wood walnut preset. Um, and sometimes one of the things that's challenging is that, and this is a really great example, for this specific uh, layer of my texture, this is just a fill layer. It's just a color, right? But then that color is being masked out by this texture pattern right here. And this, this mask, specifically this fill for the mask, is what I had to rotate 90 degrees to make it work. Okay? It kind of speaks to the power, but also the frustration of working with some of these presets. If you don't know how it's fundamentally built, it's going to be some, de some detective work to, to, get, to get the edit that you're looking for. And like you guys saw with me, I was just turning off layers till I found the one that was responsible for the effect that I needed to change, and then I started drilling down uh, specifically into that effect. It goes levels, too. levels that uh, um, it changes your histogram, the oh. distribution of all the colors within kind of a defined color space. Okay. Yeah, same idea. If you're same levels effect instead of Photoshop, okay. so basically it makes it more contrasty. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and I, and I really can't recommend doing basic texture block out, kind of like this level first. Um, I haven't really customized it, pat, you know, much past just putting some basic presets on there. Uh, you know what? I've invested about ten minutes worth of work into this thing already. If there's a problem, I want to know now, right? Uh, and I want to go back over to Moto, make some changes in Moto before I really start investing in the customization of this texture set you know, if I needed to. So, yeah, can't recommend that enough. All right, so for all intents and purposes, I'm done. This looks great. Woo! Great job, Pat. Let's get this over into Unity, right? It's a two-step little dance that we got to do, getting stuff out. It's pretty easy, but it's a step. The first step is one that is a little bit different if you're coming from a different application of Substance Painter inside of our uh, computer art production pipeline. So I want to get all of this stuff out and, uh, let me just look at everything here. Yep. I try to clean up my project file a little bit. Let's delete some of this stuff. There we go. Of course, you're going to save it. Um, but to get it out, we need to start exporting our textures. Okay. Now, you don't need to export the mesh, okay? but you need to export the textures. Okay. We already have the mesh exported from Moto, right? It's the exact same FBX file that we imported here into, uh, into Substance Painter. So we don't need to export something else, right? 
So let's export the textures. And then we have to be very, very mindful of the configuration file that we're using. Okay? So this config file determines how Unity's lighting system is going to interpret all of this information. And it's going to be a direct driver of how all this information is going to be sent out of uh, at a Substance Painter. And there's a couple things in here. Oh, look, they've even, this is new, the, the, the Unity HD render pipeline. Ooh, excellent. More on that towards the end of the semester. We have a new render pipeline. Instead of Unity, we have a, a light render pipeline and an HD render pipeline that's changing how we approach our texturing and our shading. It's pretty rad. I'm still learning it myself because it literally just came out. And I'm happy to see that Substance is supporting the HD render pipeline. Um, anyways. We want to make sure that the export preset that we're using is the Unity 5 standard metallic, not standard specular. The standard metallic links in quite wonderfully, and I mean quite wonderfully, to the standard, st standard shader over inside of Unity. Okay, So standard metallic. It's going to look radically different if you use standard specular. Okay, So I'm going to use this one. It should be the preset, and I want to say should, but Double check it. It's your responsibility as the artist to make sure that you're sending things out the way you want. Now, in addition, sometimes it's really nice just to see what Unity is going to export. You can look at the configuration files and look at all the presets, okay? Because let's see, here's Unity standard metallic. So this is what it's going to pop out, which is cool, okay? Uh, in addition, you can also twirl down this little arrow and see exactly what it's going to uh, send out to. There's one thing that I like to add in here that makes it a little bit more interactive, if you will, over Unity, gives you a little bit better result, is that I want to have my ambient occlusion map, that mesh map, all that wonderful dirt and grime uh, stuff that was baked here in Substance exported out as well. So I'm actually going to go into my Unity 5 standard metallic uh, configuration properties, and I'm going to add a new grayscale option. I'm going to copy and paste the naming convention from the, the emission section, okay? And let's just do AO, okay? So this is going to be the name of the mesh, this is going to be the name of the texture set, and then we basically get determined this, this is user defined, okay? It's going to be grayscale, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go into the mesh map section, the ambient occlusion. Check this out. I want to grab it, put it on top of the GR for grayscale. Oops. I'm all zoomed in, so it's not working. And from gray channel, poof. And now we'll get a black and white exported map of our ambient occlusion channel uh, that we find, find here in Unity. Basically, what I'm exporting here, OK? What I'm exporting, ah. is that. That map. This was baked by the mesh map bakers. And this is a great thing to have. Yeah, look at all my ambient occlusion problems. Got to fix that. This is a great thing to have over in Unity. Makes it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more photorealistic. Especially all this stuff here in the corners. That's wonderful. All that lovely shadow pooling in there. That's great. Down here at the bottom. That's awesome. Okay, let's export this out real fast because I'm running out of time. Yep, that's good. Let's export this out. I gotta know where I'm, I'm exporting it. So this is now a good chance or good time to start making some folders, right? So let's call this bookcase. And then inside, oops, this name is already taken. Do I have a bookcase folder? I do have a bookcase folder. So now we'll make a subfolder called textures and put it in there. OK, let's see what it did. Everything's out. Here's that bookcase folder on my desktop. Here's the textures that I just, oh, it didn't do everything. Oh, Unity, or Substance. I probably grabbed the wrong one. Yeah, there we go. That looking pretty good. Let's export it now. Ah, wonderful. 
Now, it didn't pop out an emission channel because I don't have any emission, in, emission information, so I don't have anything like glowy in this particular model. So nothing was tagged with the mission, so nothing was uh, exported out. So we have all four of these, right? There's my diffuse or my albedo, there's my occlusion, there's my metallic smoothness, which I'm after, and then of course my normal map information, all the height map information that the lighting is gonna reference uh, inside of Unity. Now I think this, this showcases quite wonderfully the purpose and the power of all these naming conventions, right? If you look at how the names for all the files are created, this is highly desirable, okay? Because now we know exactly which model and which material these textures are supposed to be assigned to. It's the Augur Observatory bookcase model. Here's the material name, and then here's the texture name, okay? Laser focus. If you name everything cleanly, it makes it easy over in Unity. Your media management now becomes really simple because we're not having to wonder, what was this texture file supposed to use for? Or what's untitled? Or what does texture mean, right? We, now we know, right? Or what's default? Why is everything named default, right? Now we know, okay? It all has to do with your naming conventions. Now, I already got a Unity uh, project open and running, so let's start getting some, th some stuff in here, okay? Of course, everything is gonna go into your assets assets folder. Let's make some, some additional folders in here. Oops, didn't want them nested. Now you have to make some decisions on how you want all these folders to be to be listed inside of your scene. You know, this is going to give you, always going to give you just an alphabet uh, alphabetical list. So some folks like having all their model files up top. So this is a trick that I see people doing all the time, which is absolutely cool. They'll put a little underscore, and that way all the special character folders get sorted to the top of the list first. It's a great way of working, okay? Same with scenes. Some people even put numbers in there so that it's alphabetized the way they want. Whatever system works for you is what I'm cool with. So let's import some assets here. I'm going to go grab the FBX file that I exported from Moto. It's just chilling on my desktop. There it is. Let's import it in. Now before I start dragging and dropping this over into my scene file, let's look at all of its import export properties because there's some things in here that are really important in the inspector itself. Okay. So import cameras and lights. I don't want that. Okay, I always turn that off. This is just a, this is a model asset. Um, keep quads, I'll, you know, generate colliders. I'll leave that off for the time being because I'm not sure if I need collision information on this. And I certainly don't want a mesh collider for a bookcase, right? Um, more on that later. This is all good. Now the thing that I really want uh, to turn off is the animation stuff because I just want, don't want to import the animation. And then finally for the materials, this is something that's new and I'm not quite sure personally how I, if, which system I like, okay? I'm a big fan of making it easy. So they have this new thing called embedded materials, which is a way to kind of make more of a central repository of materials. I like the old system personally because it makes it very, very easy to see which materials are assigned to which game objects, okay? So I like the, the legacy version. I have a hunch that I'm gonna need to get on board with the embedded materials thing. Because usually when they start putting legacy next to something, that's, that's Unity saying you have maybe one or two years to say goodbye to this feature before we, before we deprecate it. Um, so I, I think I have to get in, on board with it. However, I would like to emphasize the, 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 the function of this second option, the naming. So this is going to create a whole series of materials for us. When we hit apply, Unity is going to generate some materials. How it names those materials is very, very specific, okay? So by base texture name from model's material, that's interesting, okay? Or the model name plus the model's material. Personally, I would go with options number two or three. If you know you're gonna have more than one bookcase, then maybe three is your best option. I think I'm only gonna have one bookcase in my model file, and I know from my good disciplined uh, art pipeline over in Moto, that the model, the material that was assigned to the model was called bookcase. So I've made a nice clean kind of transfer of information. So I'm gonna hit that second one. All right, let's hit apply. And you can see, boom, check it out. Unity's done something automatically for us. It's created a new material that's called 
bookcase. This shouldn't come as any surprise because the name of my uh, material over in Moto was bookcase. Okay. Yay. Good job, Pat. Let's go back over in Unity. Now this is just step one. What's step two for getting all that lovely substance stuff in here? Because if you look very carefully at the material itself, what isn't it referencing? Yeah, and specifically, let's get very laser focused, the textures, okay? Because we have materials, which kind of defines how the light rays are going to interact with the surface. And then we have the textures, right? Different, very different things, OK? Um, we now need to import in all of the textures independently. And this is why I have that texture folder down there. So let's just do it real quick. Here's all of my textures. And believe it or not, I like this. I'm just going to drag and drop it into that folder. Okay. There it goes. It imports them all in. If we take a look at it, there they all are. Okay. Very easy to see where all these textures are now going to get linked. So let's start linking them up because that's the third step of getting all, these, uh, all this stuff in. So here's the material. I now need to start loading each one of these textures into the material itself to get the illusion that I'm after. Okay, it's not going to automatically do it. You got to do it. You only have to do this once. And if you've named things correctly or carefully, it, it goes pretty fast. All right, so albedo. I'm going to left click and drag, goes to albedo. Bookcase AO, the ambient occlusion map, it goes to occlusion. Metallic smoothness, this goes to metallic, okay? And then normal map is going to go to normal map. You're almost always going to get this little option. Just hit fix now. We have to tag this texture as a normal map inside of the Unity shading system so it knows to interpret the colors to influence the light and all that jazz. So just hit fix. And we're done. Let's go back to my, mo uh, to my model. And there it is. If you look down at the preview, it's looking pretty great. Let's get it into my scene. Huzzah. And that, my friends, is all she wrote. We've made the full trip. Turn my camera around. There we go. Yeah, awesome. That's looking pretty good. Let's get my main camera a little bit closer. Yeah, excellent. That's looking good. I'm pretty pleased with that. Okay. So that's the art pipeline for us. Okay. It's the full spectrum, all the different steps, and there are a lot of them. There really are. Okay. Um, but if you're disciplined in this in this sequence, you're going to find that it's a pretty consistent and uh, reproducible experience. It's a good one to have. And if you look down here, of what the, and this is this is you know what we're seeing down here is a good indication of how it's going to look in the game, but we can make it better. Uh, in the future weeks, next time we talk about art inside of Unity, we're going to talk about uh, reflections and light probes, or excuse me, reflection probes, uh, which will help starting getting all these metallic things to reflect things the way we want them to. Okay? That will be a fun day. One of the, and we'll also talk about transparent materials and transparency in that, in that conversation as well, which I know a lot of you guys are going to need for certain game objects going forward in the future. Okay? Absolutely, for sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That's that's on the horizon for sure. Yeah, we're gonna do some coding next week, and then we're gonna do some art, and then we'll do some animation, and then we'll come back to coding again. Yeah, I try to break it up so it's not like these gigantic blocks, right? Cool, huh? Yes. Thank you for the 
Yeah. All right. Okay, so we got about, what, about 45 minutes left in class. So we have two things that we need to kind of iron out for the remainder of our class time today. Okay, if we jump back over into Canvas. Um, all right, so detailed map for an interior. Now consider this new level. Think carefully about how you're going to be laying it out. When you start in on this process, what should, be, what should you be thinking about? Scale is important. What the player is going to be able to see. I like it. Absolutely. What else do we need to consider as we go through the design of this next, this next environment? Don't forget about the challenges. Okay, three unique challenges. Think about what we're trying to lead the player towards. I, I don't remember if I, did, if I didn't say this earlier, and I apologize if I, if I skipped over it. Um, there also needs to be some sort of win condition, right? So we need to have some sort of feedback if the player has done what we've asked them to do, right? Yeah, so a win condition, please. Figure out what that's going to look like. Um, and, of course, we'll start prototyping the feedback of that win condition as we start to get into the scripting, the scripting elements of, of this course. Okay? You can use whatever illustration tools that you have at your disposal. I don't care. Okay? Um, don't move on to Unity and start gray boxing this until you've done this on paper first, okay? Because the paper prototype, this, this detailed map, will allow you to make changes pretty quickly. It starts, allows you to generate an idea. That's the hardest part. You want to do, do that ideation uh, in 2D before you jump into 3D because everything in 3D is long and hard. Make sense? Everyone understand what we're doing this week? Please bring with you next week uh, a, a playable prototype, your gray box of this interior level. Okay, bring it with you. Please, 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 and I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Please ensure you're bringing your Unity project file with you every single week. Okay, we can't play your game and test your game and get feedback on these experiences if you're not bringing it. So please bring it with you. I know that a number of you guys were having some problems building a Mac version of a game at your home PCs. Uh, come here and build it. It only takes a couple minutes to build these games, okay? Um, you know, come to class 10 minutes early, run over to the design lab, or just run into here real fast, build it, submit it, okay? Um, also, I know that there's some problems with Visual Studio here on the Mac. It's not as simple as MonoDevelop was. MonoDevelop was pretty straightforward. Visual Studio is a beast. It really is. It's a big, it's a big app. And I think this is, it's only been on the Mac. It's only been out of beta on the Mac for a couple months. And uh, I think a lot of us Mac users are starting to understand that it's, it's, not, a, it's not as clean and as, uh, as crispy as, it, as we find it on, on the PC. So please be patient. Be patient as, uh, as we go through this learning. Okay, sound good? Questions, comments, everyone comfortable and sure what we're doing? All right, it's good work. What do you got?